Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm doing a Facebook Live answering your questions on writing, publishing, book marketing, making a living with your writing, whatever would be useful to you. So if you are joining me live, you can type a question in and I will answer it in this session. And if I can't get to them all, I will try and answer in the comments and uh, hopefully I'll be doing more of these. Now, I haven't done a Facebook Live for probably years <laughs> because mainly because I've been focusing on audio and uh, I love audio but because we are in the situation we're in with the uh, pandemic I've decided I need to connect more and try and be around more in person and so I'm trying out doing these Facebook lives and I'm going to try and do more videos as well. So please enter your questions and uh, while that's uh, starting to happen I am going to start with one that I've been sent by a number of people recently. So I help, uh, hope this is gonna be useful. So the question is, should you reference the pandemic in your book? So if you're writing a book right now, we're assuming here that we're talking about a novel. I mean, obviously if you're writing a non-fiction book about health or about society or whatever you're writing, then uh, you may reference it for other reasons. But if you're writing a novel set in the present time, should you reference it? So I've been thinking about this because my uh, next book, uh, Tree of Life, is an arcane thriller. It is set in the present day, but I don't want to have my character, Morgan Sierra, who's like a special agent running around with a mask on um, and talk about it that way. So I'm not going to be including it. Um, obviously, if your plot does involve something to do with the pandemic, then fair enough. But there's a couple of reasons. So firstly, when I write a novel, I I don't reference lots of things. I don't mention politics. I don't mention who's the president or the prime minister of the UK or anything like that. I don't necessarily, I don't mention celebrities. I don't mention lots of things that happen in the world. So I think that unless it's relevant, then you don't necessarily need to mention it. The other thing is that, I don't know about you, but I'm feeling like we're getting enough of it and I don't want to put it in my creative side right now. However, the opposite uh, angle is that you feel this is uh, giving you ideas for plot and you want to write something, so go ahead. <laughs> so basically it is it is up to you, um, but a lot of people have been asking me my opinion and as ever, these are just my opinions. I personally am choosing not to have my characters uh, wear masks and I'm not gonna reference lockdown in my next book. That may change over time, but I wanted to um, give you that. Okay, so uh, thanks for those of you who are here. And Scott says, um, thanks Joanna, would you recommend a new author concentrate on one piece of work or if you have multiple projects, would you run them in parallel? Okay, so, uh, oh, there's a button I can add. Oh, there we go, fantastic, comes up on the screen. Uh, so essentially, this is a great question. And what I would say is, it's really gonna depend on your uh, confidence. I personally will never work on two fiction projects at the same time, as in I won't be like um, Map of the Impossible, or I just show you since we're on video. This is the second print out. Uh, there you go. Um, the second print out in my folder. And uh, I, while I'm finishing that project, I won't start another one. Now, of course, I'm thinking of ideas. I've got about 15 different folders in my computer where I'm keeping ideas and lots of notes and things, but I won't start working on another book until that one is out of my head and to my editor. The reason why is that many people, like many people start lots of projects and people generally don't finish projects. So, you know, there's some ridiculous statistics about 80% of people want to write a book, but most people never do. And I think a lot of people start a book or start a project, but they never necessarily finish them. A good example would be uh, some of my screenplays. I've written a few screenplays, but I haven't finished them uh, because I haven't taken it through to its final point. And I think if you try and work on multiple projects, you may struggle because your brain is, is going all the which way. So I personally think you have to use finishing energy and finishing energy is that last bit of the project where you take your, your draft or whatever you're doing 
to publication or if you're submitting to a traditional publisher, uh, submitting there. So you finish that project and then you can work on another. So especially you said a new author, I think a lot of new authors would find it difficult to juggle. I'm not a new author and I still find it difficult to juggle. So yes, some people do it, um, but personally, I think um, finishing is uh, really important. Okay, uh, Kate says, uh, um, what would be your number one tip for new authors starting a self-publishing career or launching, or launching a new pen name in 2020. Okay, so a new author starting a self-publishing career. Look, <laughs> I know this is really unpopular advice and no one wants to hear it, but if you're launching a career, then it's not with one book. I mean, I have a nice backdrop here of uh, some of my many books and the the reality is that you cannot make a career from one book unless it is a non-fiction book where you are basing a speaking career, you're doing courses, you're doing all the other things around a non-fiction book, basically. So I presume, uh, Kate, you're talking about um, fiction, you're talking about a pen name, so probably... so. Realistically, the advice right now from many of the people doing very well is to write several books in a series and then to put money into building your list and building sales once you've got a few books. But I mean, I totally understand about lack of patience. I have never had the patience to hold on to books. I always just write them and put them out there. So you can try and build a career fast or you can build a career like me slowly and over time. And that perhaps is the difference between the kind of short term focus and the long term. But I love the fact that you have used the word career, because that is definitely what I always wanted was a career. And to me, a career is a long term thing. It's not a um, a short term thing. <laughs> so it obviously takes time to build a career. I guess like, coming back to when I was an IT consultant, uh, or any career, if you're a teacher, if you're whatever you are, in the first year of a job, how much are you worth? Do people give you the good pieces of work? Do you get any respect? Do you get paid a lot? No, you don't. When do you start getting to a decent point in any career? It's at least five years in. And then at 10 years in, you know what you're doing and you have a reputation and you've learned along the way. So yeah, this is a long answer, but... Um, maybe find a model of someone who has done what you want to do in the time frame you want to do it and model them. Okay, Andy Rose says, as a new writer with only two flash fiction collections out, would you focus on building a mailing list or writing the next book? Great question. Um, okay, so what you've got, you've got two flash fiction collections. I have to ask, what is the next book? Because if your book is another flash fiction collection, then, um, you know, that's something that you can do at the same time as building a mailing list. And in fact, in general, you would, uh, you, you would focus on building a mailing list at the same time as doing anything else. So I'm, every day I'm building my email list. Every day, I'm working on the next book. So I would say your bigger question, Andy, is do you want to write only flash fiction or do you want to now expand into short stories? What else do you want to do? Um, and that will help you decide on that question. I'm just gonna get my cup of tea, <laughs> which I have here. Incidentally, I've uh, this cup, which it, I'm, I'm a creature of habit in many ways, this cup, um, which says more than they say I can. Uh, I got that as part of a Seth Godin thing years ago and I use it for tea every single day. It is my teacup. It is peppermint tea in case you were interested. <laughs> okay, uh, great. Scott says, good answer. I'll concentrate on the most advanced. And Kate says, thank you. Uh, appreciate it. Right, next question. Uh, Shirley says, I have five short stories of 10,000 words each. What is the easiest method for creating a box set? Great question, easy answer if you're, well, in fact, either way, 
Vellum. Vellum software is basically changed the game, right? So with any kind of um, publishing, oh, I need to just remove this, uh, with any kind of uh, formatting, whether it's a box set or just a normal book, ebook or print book, Vellum is magic. I mean, when it came on the scene, must have been four or five years ago now, uh, it was just, you know, it just changed everything. And I'm going to, this, this, there's some beeping and uh, some popping. I don't know whether you can hear it, but um, I'm going to see if this works and hope you can still hear me. <laughs> I'm hoping that that will stop the popping and that you can still hear me. Uh, looks like you can still hear me. So that's good. Hopefully it'll stop the popping. Tell me if you can hear the popping. Um, <laughs> This is new software. It's called Ecamm Live and I'm just still figuring it out. <laughs> so going back to Shirley's question. Uh, basically, when Vellum came on the scene a few years back, we all were like, oh, what's this? And then as soon as we all started using it, it was everything. I mean, I really would struggle to run my business without Vellum. So I think that um, making a box set is really easy as well. You just drag and drop the files in is brilliant. So yeah, Vellum is brilliant. Um, and a box set uh, generally is an ebook product, but of course with 50,000 words, you can also do a print, um, a print book. So uh, many people use um, Vellum for print. I still hire my print formatting out because I like, uh, you know, I, I just can't be bothered. Like we all have our strengths and weaknesses and mine is figuring out what I want in a print book. So I just give it to JD Smith Design as my designer. Uh, Roseanne said you might need InDesign for something with a lot of charts or graphics. That is correct. Uh, although Vellum does have chart, like image, good image sizing and stuff. But with short stories, you're not going to need that anyway. So yeah, Vellum is my tip. It is Mac only, but you can use Mac in cloud on a PC. So, and in fact, I know writers now who buy a secondhand Mac just so they can use Vellum because it's just so brilliant. Obviously, if you're going to use multiple, uh, if you're going to produce multiple books, then having software like Vellum means you're in control. And uh, if you'd like to, to use my link, it is thecreativepen.com forward slash Vellum. And that is my affiliate link. Okay, just grabbing some more tea. I hope this is useful. I, uh, I was quite nervous. I'm always a bit nervous doing live video. I think something's going to go horribly wrong. But we'll just carry on. <laughs> Okay, right. Wendy says, Hi, Joanna. I'm wondering if you've ever had anyone on your podcast from Ingram Spark. It'd be great to learn some more on pricing and how to set prices, which I find slightly confusing. Okay, um, so basically, yes, I have had Andy Bromley from Ingram Spark on my show uh, a while back. Um, you could, if you go to thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast or just search, use the search bar on the uh, homepage, you can find uh, for Ingram or Andy Bromley, you'll find that interview. But your question is really about learning about pricing and how to set prices. Okay, so the, the difference with pricing on Ingram Spark is you need to include a discount because they sell to bookstores. And remember, bookstores make their money from a discount. So we have to sell them a discounted book and they have a markup and that's how they make income, which is why print bookstores are in a, a bit of trouble right now uh, during the pandemic. But um, essentially on Ingram Spark, you can do mostly the same as what you do on other stores. So you put in how much you want to make and then it will tell you what your profit's going to be on the pricing screen. So you generally you actually have to price higher than KDP print in order to include a discount. That's what I do. Um, and I haven't had an issue with that. So I just use a 35% discount. Some people swear by going with the 50 or more discount. I don't do returns um, because returns you, you could end up out of pocket. I don't like being out of pocket. I like money coming in my direction. So I don't use uh, returns. But again, many people who sell a lot to physical bookstores say you need to do returns. So you get to decide that. So there are some more publisher type things to work out if you go through Ingram Spark, but you can just keep it simple, uh, which which I do. So hopefully that helps. Oh, Helen says, very useful. Don't worry, it's going well. <laughs> Thank you, Helen. 
Uh, okay, right. Next question. Um, I won't put this on the screen because it's quite long. Um, from Roseanne says, I currently have a middle grade fantasy trilogy based off Peter Pan. I just finished book one in a contemporary YA fantasy. I know to build your career, you should probably keep writing in the same genre. My issue is I love fantasy, but there are so many subgenres. It's what I write. Um, my new series has more in common with urban fantasy rather than a fairy tale type of fantasy. Should I go with a fa fairy tale series using a spin off character or is it okay to branch out? Okay, Roseanne, you're clearly, you have lots of ideas. I'm exactly the same as you. Uh, I, and of course, my Map Walker series is fantasy. I usually write action adventure thrillers. I also have crime thriller series, and a lot of my readers don't cross over <laughs> between those. So, what can you do? You just follow your muse as such. But I think this comes back to the career answer I gave um, at the top at the top of this, which is that to be creative for the long term, you have to respect your muse and you can't bore yourself. And this is really important, I think. I've been doing this a while now and I have seen so many people arrive on the scene and disappear quite quickly. Within a year, two years, they're gone. And I think it's because they probably just try and niche down into one thing and get bored or they just don't achieve what they think they're going to achieve. Whereas you're saying you really love, you love fantasy, you've got some different types of fantasy. It's still fantasy. I mean, if you do promotions on, you know, sites that work with fantasy, I think Book Barbarian is one of them. Uh, you'll see how they niche things. So I would suggest that you just go with what you want in that situation and um, figure out how to market each of those subcategories. But that's, you know, that's kind of how I do it. <laughs> but I realise that there are people who sell a lot more fiction than me and they just write in one genre. But I just can't do that, you know. And you're probably here because you can't either. <laughs> Right. Julia says, I'm about to start writing a textbook for my students, but will also sell wide. What is the best software for that type of book? I have Scrivener, but it doesn't seem the best software uh, for a this. I don't know if you mean for a thesis, uh, but it's a, if it's a textbook. OK, so um, with a textbook, yeah, you're going to need the end notes and the references and you might need all kinds of things. Scrivener does have stuff like that, but um, there are software packages that work particularly with academic books. Um, I can't think of it off the top of my head. If anyone knows, please put it in the notes. Um, but essentially there are... Um, it might be EndNote, might be one of the ones that does all of that reference material, but then also you'll get, you might need an index, uh, all of that type of thing. But when you say software, I'm not quite sure whether you mean software for writing or for publishing. Um, again, the I, I don't know about vellum and academic books. So sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. I think I'm just gonna have to back away and say I haven't done one of those. <laughs> Uh, okay, Kate says, oh, Janelle says InDesign would work for textbook formatting. Yes, absolutely. It's just a case of the writing. If you're writing a textbook, you often have to do those footnotes and the uh, different things like that. Okay, uh, Kate has popped in again and said, just for fun question, when travel opens up again, where's the first place you'd like to go? Do you know, it's so funny because um, we have talked a lot about this, talk about this all the time, in fact, but I think that travel is going to open up in a very slow manner. And so I will probably be going to Hereford, which is a couple of hours drive from where I am because I want to go visit the cathedral. I also want to visit um, Canterbury, which is uh, near London. And again, like, few hours drive for me and that's about as much as I'm looking at at the moment. The other option is to go really far which is New Zealand because my husband's a Kiwi, my mother-in-law lives in New Zealand and uh, we have considered going over there. To be fair if I can't get a haircut or dye my um, my grey roots <laughs> I might just have to go to New Zealand for a haircut <laughs> and maybe stay a while because they're um, opening up far more than the UK for sure. Uh, okay 
next question. Let's just have some tea. Right, uh, Byron says, uh, thank you, I'm finishing the edits on my first novel, about to hit go on my author website. I'm listening to how to market a book, thank you. Um, oh wait, I always get it wrong, but there, the other side. <laughs> there, there it is. Um, I'm nearly finished Mark Dawson's 101 course. I just finished Map of Shadows, thank you. Being a writer seemed an impossible task for other people until I came across you. Oh, that's good, please keep going. Thank you, Byron, I will keep going. And I think that comes back to what I said earlier about the career aspect. Um, uh, there are many, still many days when I'm like, how will I ever be like Stephen King? Or, you know, how will I be, how can I do this for the rest of my life? What do I need to do better? How can I be better? And all of that. And it can seem really hard some days. And then you just have to go, well, what do I want with my life? And I like doing this, you know, so I got to keep doing it. <laughs> uh, okay. Patricia says, uh, oh, I can add this one. Love your arcane and Matt Walker books. Thank you. And your videos. Uh, I'm thinking of self-publishing a children's picture book and chapter book. Would you upload to Ingram Spark first or Amazon first? Uh, okay, so first of all, with um, children's books, I highly recommend Karen Inglis. Uh, she has a website, selfpublishingadventures.com, and she has a book on how to self-publish and market a children's book. That is a must read. I have uh, interviewed Karen on the podcast several times and um, you can uh, go listen to that, go read her book and that will really help you. Um, so she will talk about it. But obviously Ingram, you can you can do the wide publishing and but I would suggest you do both. So um, there isn't, this isn't an either or for print. So I go with my uh, books, regardless of what genre, I publish on Amazon KDP for ebooks and all the other ebook platforms I'm, I publish wide. Then I publish on KDP Print and Ingram Spark at the same time. Uh, and that means your book is available on in the Amazon ecosystem with the way that they like, and then it's in the wide ecosystem through Ingram. So you can do that, it's completely fine. Uh, so when you say first, it doesn't, it's, it's kind of do, do both. Oh, Roseanne says another great resource is the Indie Kidlet podcast. There's a huge backlist of episodes. That's great. Uh, right. Um, where are we? Oh, there we go. So a couple of other questions. If you have any other questions, please do um, add them in. I wanted to come to something that I also get asked a lot, which is how do you keep yourself motivated to work on a book when it's difficult or you're finding it um, a slog? And I wanted to address this because I feel like sometimes people, and people use the word writer's block and all this type of thing, but it's not so much writer's block when it's a slog. I think it's essentially that um, things are just harder sometimes. And a bit like with Map of the Impossible, I started writing that in NaNoWriMo and then I was like, well, I am not ready to write this book and I want to write the audio book. That comes back to the question about working on two projects. The book audio for authors was, um, I started, again, I started that one and then I, cause I had NaNoWriMo, I was like, oh, I need to work on something else and I just couldn't do it. So I stopped Map of the Impossible. I finished audio for authors and then I went back to Map of the Impossible and then the pandemic hit and then I kind of broke again. And, it's hard, you know, it's not easy to write books, even when you've written a lot of books, this is still hard work, people. So the pushing through energy, I talked about finishing energy earlier, the pushing through energy is the thing that gets you through the difficult times. I am one of those people who doesn't believe in writer's block, I think there's other reasons, for example, you haven't done enough research, you don't know your craft well enough, you need to do some more learning, uh, you, yeah, you, you just don't have the energy, um, emotional energy, physical energy, many of those things. Uh, so when it's a slog, I think you have to come back to uh, what do I really want with this book and with my life. And coming back to that finishing energy, I have never started a book 
that I have not finished. So every book I start, I finish. And uh, and I've published everything as well. <laughs> you don't have to do that. Obviously, many people have things they haven't published, but I have... I think it's one of my strengths is finishing projects and I think that's the only way you can do this so that is that is that question around it things being a slog uh, I think it's it's about what do you really want for this book for your author career and what can you do to help yourself through this process and if you've been listening to the podcasts um, when I had um, Mark McGuinness on and he helped me through the sort of pandemic issues <laughs> I was having and helped me get back to my um to my writing uh oh, Julia says thank you for your podcast I've been listening every Monday afternoon when I do the food shopping at Tesco <laughs> it makes a horrible task of shopping something I look forward to thank you so much that's really useful um Julia uh okay going back to the questions uh Byron says my novel is a mystery. I've noticed that Alexander McCall Smith, who, let's face it, is super famous, <laughs> targets book clubs on his website by offering docs for discussion topics and questions. Have you ever experimented with book clubs? It's a really good question, Byron, and uh, I would like to. I have one, I think it's Desecration. I, I had a book club want it and I wrote questions for them and uh, sent them the questions and I did a QA and a bit like this uh, on the book but they approached me. I have never marketed to book clubs and what I would say is it is a very specific form of marketing which I don't know about but if you um, there are webinars and there are books on how to market to book club book clubs um, but usually you, you need bulk sales you need questions as you do you need special offers but I, I think that's it's a really good idea and I think that's something that um, indies should be doing more of. It There are companies, especially in the US, who focus on doing these reach outs to book clubs. So it is something that I've had on my list and has not reached the top yet. So if you discover how to do this, then uh, please do share. Okay. Uh, Lisa says, there are so many competing voices in the marketing space. Who do you listen to? Oh, <laughs> Lisa. Oh, if only that was an easy answer for that one. Um, okay. There are two parts to this answer. Who do you listen to as a broader concept? And then who do I listen to? So who do you listen in a broader concept? Coming back to your author career, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's really important to find models. And again, we're not talking about plagiarism. Um, I've never had a mentor, as in someone who I meet with. I've never had a mastermind. But I find um, models in terms of people who are doing the things that I want to do. And I look at how they got there and I do what they did. So uh, when I first started, before I started writing fiction, um, Yarrow Starak, who's been on my podcast a number of times, uh, he's at yarrow.blog, Y-A-R-O.blog. Uh, I learned how to do websites and blogging and podcasting from Yarrow and that's underpinned my business. So I picked him early as someone I wanted to model because he was an introvert, he was making money online, he was making very good money online, he bought a house uh, soon after I started following him in Australia back in whenever that was, 2008, something like that. He's still doing lots of stuff, I've had him on the show a number of times. And, uh, and then when I started writing fiction, I looked at and hilariously, I mean, I for my genre, I, I wanted to model Dan Brown and James Rollins, Clive Cussler. So that's on the craft side. On the on the business side and the marketing, back when I started in 2011, there weren't really many people doing what I was doing. So I sort of made it up. But the main thing in terms of who you listen to, it's got to be someone who is achieving the goals that you want to achieve. So, for example, I'm not in KU. There is no point in listening to me on KU. Go listen to someone who's super successful in KU or someone who is making loads of money with the type of book that you write. Those are the people you should listen to. I'm really good on podcasting and doing um, audio 
I think actually that's one of my strengths. I'm good at content marketing for attracting people to my work. I am not the best, I'm definitely not the best person on paid ads. You know, for that you go to Mark Dawson. So I think decide on who you trust as well. It's got to be someone whose voice resonates with you. Um, I mean, for me, who I listen to, obviously I do listen to Mark Dawson. He's a personal friend. He's also a business partner in that I'm an affiliate for his ads course. I do think his course is incredibly high value and high quality. So he would be someone, uh, someone like Dave Chesson at Kindlepreneur, very good with um, providing stuff on tools and useful stuff. In fact, I went to Dave's site, Kindlepreneur dot com uh just this morning uh because i got a book bub for map of shadows in a couple of weeks time and i wanted to add stack and i was like i don't even know what the latest free and paid promotional services are so i went to dave's site and he has a useful link to here are all the free and paid um promotion sites right now so and i'll link to that later in in the notes when i annotate this video but um so that's someone i i trust as well so you have to decide who you trust who you resonate with and who has achieved what you want to achieve please don't listen to people who have not achieved much <laughs> there's a lot of people talking about book marketing but you have to see whether actually they're walking the talk first okay i think that answers that one right uh helen says i'm wrestling with scrivener have you succeeded in dragging and dropping into the research folder? I know what your problem is, Helen. It's very hard for me to show you right now. But basically, um, I struggled with this too. You have to drop it into the icon. It's like the icon in the, um, I presume you're talking about a website. I did this for ages. It's essentially in the left-hand corner, you drag and drop the icon into the folder, uh, on, uh, yeah, into the, the, the thing. <laughs> It's really hard to explain. I'm going to have to annotate this video and actually uh, add that in. But um, yeah, it's the little icon on the URL, not the URL itself. I did struggle on that for ages. Uh, okay. Mm. A few more. I'm going to go for probably 10 more minutes. Um, so feel free. Uh, I'm actually, in fact, Helen says, are you speaking at any more online conferences? I'm actually speaking at the Career Author Summit. I was meant to be in Nashville <laughs> this weekend. Uh, so I'm online with um, the, the summit uh, in uh, in half an hour. So I'm doing this first and then I'm getting my gin and tonic, finishing my tea, getting my gin and tonic and doing a Q&A uh, with the uh, Career Author Summit not in Nashville. Uh, okay. Uh, Byron says, uh, I've switched to pro writing aid from Grammarly based on your recommendation. Great. And couldn't be happier. Uh, fantastic. Because, um, I also have switched uh, to be fair. I'm still using Grammarly within Chrome on my, for my email and my website. I've decided like I've been weighing them up, but pro writing aid for books, is awesome and particularly for um, longer works it's really totally designed for books um, so yeah Byron says no more cutting and pasting chapters from Scrivener yes however some of the reports can be pretty scathing how closely do you watch the stats and try to meet the targets okay so what Byron's talking about here is when you upload your book into Pro Writing Aid or you can open it within Scrivener which is brilliant and Grammarly doesn't do that uh, you can you get these things that will tell you for example your grammar is this your sentence length is this your it's really really detailed okay so what I do Byron is I pay attention to the things I know are bad I know my passive voice can be difficult in my first draft so I definitely go through and fix that type of thing up um I I do now have a look at things like sentence length and complication and I, I basically have a look at it all but then I read it and I decide what my how I'm going to change it. But I do the same thing with my editor's notes and even my proofreader's notes. I don't change everything. So I would use it as a tool and a buddy, a writing buddy, writing coach. And you don't have to make all the changes, but I do like um, running it again once I've made some changes to see if I can better my score, for example. Uh, okay, Kate says, see you there. Um, 
sorry to miss out on a trip to Nashville maybe next year. Okay, great, Kate. I'll see you see you inside that next one. Thanks for joining me here first. <laughs> You'll have to ask a different question. Um, oh, thanks, Becky, says lovely Joanna. Thank you so much. That's very sweet. Uh, Andy Rose says, I've been working on a trilogy but want to expand it into a longer series. How do you keep a series going without it dropping off? Ah, okay. So, um... This is what happened to me with my arcane books, but this dep again depends on the model that you're using for your books. So the, and it's interesting because Map of Shadows was meant to be a standalone and turned into a trilogy. This happens to us all. <laughs> so the difference is if you've written a trilogy, but you want to expand it into a longer series, you're gonna have to open some more loops. And if you've written it as a trilogy, there will be a natural ending. So I have just done this with Map of the Impossible. I won't give a detail on the ending in case you wanna read it, but I have ended the character arc of the main character who was introduced in Map of Shadows. It's not It's not ended. I don't want anyone who's read it, it's not ended, uh, but it is ended and but what I have done is introduce enough other people that I can carry on the series uh, or maybe write some spin-off novellas or something and uh, the world is still there and that's kind of what you have to do if you've written a trilogy. Now the alternative to that is my Arcane series because I wrote Stone of Fire and I wanted it to be a series. I knew I wanted it to be, in fact, in my mind, it was, um, if you know the TV series Castle, not in that it's a police procedural, my books are not pl police procedural, but the um, the episodic each book is like a castle episode where you come in, the two characters who are kind of flirting with shouldn't ever get together uh, even though they did in castle they shouldn't have it ruined the whole thing or bones would be another example and then in the in the story they solve the thing and then at the end the characters just move on and that's the model that I use a kind of episodic writing series versus a trilogy which has a a, a clear arc over the trilogy so they are actually quite different ways of writing and you'll have to decide um, how you're going to do that but essentially you just have to open more characters and more questions. Open loops is the um, is the answer. Okay right I'm going to answer one more question. Um, Gus or Goose, Goose Le Schlomb. I hope I'm saying that right it's a great name. Uh, okay so I will answer this one. Uh, thank you for saying you love my work. The, the cliche says, a work of art is never finished, just abandoned. How do you make that decision? When do you say, okay, this is done, time to move on to the next thing? This is a really good question. And partly when I talked about finishing energy earlier, this definitely comes into it. And I know that a lot of people never publish because it's never finished. You are correct. Technically, you could edit forever, but if you do that, you're never going to put, put a book out. And I actually think you're never going to improve either. Now, um, I constantly think, oh, I must rewrite Stone of Fire and Crypt of Bone. And I must rewrite all, all my first three books, for example. But then I look at the reviews and I think, actually, it's fine. You know, people like it. It's got you know 800 reviews or something and that it's four point whatever it is uh, average. So it's fine. So even though I feel like I should do that, I have moved on. And so you have to have a process and then you have to accept that process is enough. So my process is write the first draft, then I do the big edit, print it all out, big edit, and I just finish the big edit. Then I print it all out again, I do the second edit, and the second edit is generally word, word fixes, grammar fixes, stuff like that by hand, hence the... Uh, the uh, printout here that I have and then and I print it double sided so it looks like um, uh, a book <laughs> essentially it looks like a book and I'm writing in it so I do that and then I put the changes back in Scrivener then I use Pro Writing Aid and do another quick pass that doesn't take long probably a few hours to do that pass 
Then I send it to my editor, my first reader, Jen. Now I've written a lot of books at this point, so I'm pretty happy with it, but Jen always comes back with a couple of things. So, and she does story edit, not line edit. Uh, so get that back, make those changes. Then I will um, send it to my proofreader and she will do the final stuff and then I'll change it one more time and then I'll publish it. <laughs> so that might sound complicated. I do have um, a whole load of stuff about editing on on the website obviously but yeah you have to at some point you have to say I'm happy with this at this point in my life and I'm going to write the next thing and people will come to you at different points in your journey and in fact uh, David uh, Perlmutter says here exactly what I think I also look at reviews and say no <laughs> and uh, I know David has um, quite a few books as well so yeah um so that would be my answer. You have to have your process of making the very best book you can make and then you just stick to that process. So if you're if you're traditionally published, you have to follow a process that is you, you know, do the best book you can. You send it to an agent. An agent will give you notes. You do some rewrites. Then that agent will try and sell it and it will go to a publisher and the publisher will also you'll get an editor and they will also give you rewrites. But then there'll be a certain number of um changes that can go through before the contract hits publication. So for indie authors, you have to think the same thing. You have to think I have a deadline for publication and I have my um, process and I, I move towards that. So I hope that helps. Okay, I'm gonna uh, stop now. I need to go and make my gin and tonic <laughs> before I do my next live. Thank you all for coming. Um, uh, thank you for your lovely comments here. Um, thanks to Suzanne and uh, from Helen. Um, really appreciate you guys coming and um, I will put this on the uh, blog and on my YouTube channel with the notes, uh, with links and things like that so you can find all the resources I've talked about. Uh, as ever, please do like and share the video and uh, remember you can get my free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint that contains lots of stuff and of course tune in uh, for the creative pen podcast every Monday on your favorite podcast app I will be um, back here at some point <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not sure when I will do another one of these, but I definitely hope to do it. All right, everyone. Well, happy writing and I'll see you next time.